I've, I've, I've gotten more press from shooting Mickey, from Rolling Stone and Variety, and more, more than I can even remember. And the photo that's done the best for me is uh, I took a shot of Mickey at a CD release party down at um, 54 Below, the old uh, Studio 54, I think that's the name of it. And, uh, you know, we were hanging out. He invited me out to come and see a CD that I had just done all the photos for the album. And uh, we're upstairs sitting in the dressing room, and I said, do you mind if I take your picture? And I always get kind of weird with taking pictures of people backstage because I never want to, like the golden rule for me is to never, ever, ever publish anything that you even question is embarrassing or not flattering. Like generally, if I even, if I think, oh, this is totally cool, this is great, they're gonna love this. But if I hear that one little voice that says, maybe they won't think this is funny, or maybe they, generally I just stop right there. Because as soon as you, as soon as you ask that question, that's probably telling you something right off the bat. But I got this shot of Mickey sitting in his dressing room taking, and I sat on this photo for years because I had no, nothing to do with it. I published it on Instagram once or twice and got a lot of, you know, a little bit of love on it, but uh, that was it. And recently there was an album that he just did recording all Mike Nesmith songs, great album. And um, they called me for photos. I submitted a bunch of photos to them. And then I said, after the fact, I said, you know, I have this one other shot of Mickey that I'm kind of saving for something special. Because to me, it, when you shoot a lot of photos, I think you just know sometimes when you have something that's really special. Like, uh, I'll shoot a band like the Mavericks, maybe, or, or my buddies, Blackberry Smoke, and depending on the night, 4,000 photos, sometimes more, depending on how crazy I'm feeling. And uh, so anyway, when you see a photo that really blows you away, when you've looked at thousands of photos and one just, you're like, whoa, what happened here? I'm not b being sent by AP or Getty Images to go and shoot a show. I'm shooting for me and the guys on the stage. I always say, if you like a couple of photos, you know, I'll send you some photos, whatever. And the, if it's going to be published or used that I can make a couple bucks, great. Um, for many years, I shot with a D800, Nikon D800, which is a, a really nice uh, prosumer camera. Like I'm looking at this, I don't know, I don't know where that falls in, but um, it was a, a you know a pretty good photo, a pretty good uh, camera. I had two of them, and uh, would shoot with that. When I got the D5, which was at the time the top of the line Nikon, and I could shoot in bursts of like 14 frames a second, that was sick. I was like, you almost have to purposely try to screw up the, to to not get a shot. And the one thing I do, though, because being a being a musician, uh, I think I I like to think maybe I have an awareness that maybe other photographers might not. If you're just a guy with a camera, great as you may be or not, you're not a musician, maybe, and you don't have a certain feel for something or an instinct, maybe for something. Like for instance, when I shoot, uh, Blackberry Smoke plays at the shed every year and it's a whole big thing where their fans come from all over the country to get to this thing and I used to go down to those I haven't done it in a couple of years but um, there was a shot I remember I saw years ago of Gene Krupa where the guy had the camera like under the toms shooting like through music stands and whatnot to get that shot of Krupa behind the drums and you know Britt Turner is up there behind the drums during the sound check and I just go you know you're cool oh yeah you know do your thing so I go up on the stage, and they're playing, by the way. They're doing their, you know, their full sound check show thing, whatever. And uh, I get on the stage, and I'm lying down <laughs> under his drums. And he's playing, watching me, and he's cracking up like, what is this jackass doing down there? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, on my, on my elbows trying to get that shot. And I got, the sh I got a couple great shots. And, and they're like, you can't get that shot during a show unless somehow you're allowed to do that. But even then, somebody may trip over you while they're performing. Uh, things like that. And those guys just always trusted me. They just gave me carte blanche. Like I yeah. have uh, Well, my dad was a drummer when he was a kid. 
and he was an art was an artist, a uh, cartoonist mainly, but an artist. His father was an artist. My grandmother was an opera singer. She used to have a radio show in Westchester Radio at some point. I don't exactly know what years. And uh, she used to sing a little bit, and she was self-taught on the piano. She had a baby grand in the house. So whenever we would go to visit Granny as kids, uh, there was a piano there. There was a snare drum and some cymbals there of my dad's. And then one day, uh, we were coming across the Tappan Zee Bridge. I have two sisters and a brother, and the four of us were in our Chevy Nova station wagon and driving across the Tappan Zee Bridge. And I had snuck the drum into the back of the station wagon, and my mother almost drove off the bridge when I hit it. And the words I was, oh no, that's going right back to your grandmother's as soon as we get come back out here next week. And needless to say, it never went back. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning of, of having a drum in my house. But literally, as long as I'm alive, I can, I was hitting a drum. Yeah, as an was... older teenager, I guess, I would want to say I'm very proud that I studied with Joe Morello for several years. And Joe was like a second father to me. And Joe, for anybody who doesn't know, was with Dave Brubeck during all the glory years and did Take Five and Blue Rondo a la Turk and is one of the greatest drummers to ever, one of the greatest musicians to ever, ever walk around on this planet. Just the greatest guy. And I have a lot of stories about Joe that were just they're funny and great and inspiring. He was just a tremendous human being that, like I said, he was like a second father to me for a while. Um, Been on some of the same cruises. Um, and, uh, so a lot of switch, talented guys. I'm going to switch gears for a second. Sure. So I think I know the answer of this because of your Ringo comment. But are you a Beatles or Stones guy? Beatles. I love the Stones. Don't get me wrong. And Keith is the coolest. And Charlie was, you know, Charlie was Charlie. There's just nobody like him. And um, the guy who sold me my drums has a really famous drum store in New York City and Chicago, Steve Maxwell, who is a wonderful, wonderful guy. And he made it possible for me to get my Caraviato drums, which are, to me, the best drums in the world. Uh, things like that. But the Beatles, you know, like, like the world kind of stops when, when the Beatles come into the equation. Especially, I, I kind of wish I was maybe five or ten years older because I would have really caught it. But I remember seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan at my, my other grandmother's house, my mom's mother, and my grandfather going like, look at these guys, these, they look like a bunch of girls. And you know, with the, she loves you with the hair and all that. And I remember that, I was five, you know, it was like, damn, cool stuff. Uh, and when they would come on, I remember they came on Ed Sullivan and did a Let It Be. His opening soon is just jammed with new songs. And as a special treat, here are the Beatles performing the title song, Let It Be. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother May. And it was like kind of mind blowing. I was, I guess, nine at that point, or ten. But um, the big disappointment was it wasn't live, because most of the stuff on Ed Sullivan was live. But it was basically a clip from from the Let It Be sessions that you know them doing their thing. But even having said that, it was like, you know, you just knew that this is something like nothing else all throughout their whole run. You know, there was nothing like it. Sunday. Sunday would be, Dad would be sitting at the hi-fi. He had a lot of albums. Nothing compared to what I have now, but at, back then, we had a lot of albums, a couple hundred albums. And um, he'd sit there on the floor with his hi-fi on and just pull one record out after the next. And it would go from Ted Heath, which was a kick-ass big band, really kick-ass band, and Basie, to me, the greatest big band ever uh, to this day. Um, Harry James, G Gene Krupa's drumming. You know, where do you go with that? I mean, I wanted to be that also. 
and and Louis Armstrong loved Louis Armstrong. I still he's he, you know when are you gonna Louis is the king. It's like Elvis in jazz, you know. It's like Louis Armstrong. Forget it. Um, Blackberry Smoke came out, and I was floored. It was like, and Zach Brown is great. They are great, unbelievable band. But having said that, I saw a couple of minutes of Blackberry Smoke, and it was like, I don't even give a crap about Zach Brown at this point. And I, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's more like this is what I want. And Blackberry Smoke is just real. Uh, rootsy, down to earth, no bullshit, no, no, I don't, I don't know how to put it, but they're just, they're as legit as it gets. And they remain so to this day. And so my first car that I owned was a 1979 Chevy Monza station wagon. So I went from a hatchback to a station wagon. The life of a drummer, unfortunately, is you've always got to have a wagon, a hatchback, something you can fit your drums into which really limits your options. For a while, I drove a Mazda MX-6 LS, which is a really kind of a sporty car in the 90s, and I loved it, it was so cool. And I had stopped playing for a couple of years. I figured, all right, it's, it's, there's nothing happening for me musically, because my day jobs were, were taking all my time. And then I started getting calls again to play. I was like, how the hell am I gonna get my drums to gigs? So the bass drum was in the passenger seat, I, they should have hired me to do a car commercial because fitting the drums in the car was it was absurd. But I did it. I did it. So no one could, no one from family or friends or girlfriends could come to my gigs. <laughs> They'd have to drive themselves. Wow. It's like breathing. You know, it's like the thought of uh, the thought of not having it. You know, I'm 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 really glad I wasn't born in Iran with the Ayatollah when he banned music, that would have been, <laughs> that would have been rough. <laughs> that would have been rough. Although I, I might consider banning a lot of the things I hear today, which they call music, which just sounds like the music they play at the gym. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of everything. It's always there. And even if it's not on, it's running through my head and, and you know, Artwork and photography is the same thing. You know, you just have a dream about it. You can be lying in bed, and all of a sudden you just wake up thinking, oh, I could have done this, I could have done that. It, again, it could be about music, it could be photography. It's all, it's like all one big, one big thing to me. We had people who lived next door to us, and, uh, they had some teenagers in the house, and they used to only come up on weekends because they had a membership at Delwood Country Club. So the house in New City was their weekend house. I think they lived in Queens, I think, or somewhere out there. Anyway, uh, they had three tickets to go to a concert at Forest Hills, and one of the teenagers decided they didn't want to go. So uh, they came and knocked on my parents at, you know, on the house and the door, and just said, we know Paul loves music and drums because we hear him. Uh, they didn't say it in a bad way, but obviously, you know, we hear him banging away down there. And, uh, you know, we have tickets to see the monkeys. And uh, one of the kids doesn't want to go. Do you want to go? So I would just be going with these two older teenagers that were probably like maybe 19 and 18. Maybe they were 20. I, I don't know. They were, you know, young. And me. What and year was this? 1967 and I was eight and my parents were like Paul do you want to go to see the monkeys what do you think I said to that I mean come on so and I've never been you know never been to a concert here I am this little hick from New City going. so they took me and I believe I can't remember it but everything that I know about the show was Jimi Hendrix was the opening act and Jimi Hendrix was told to leave the tour because when you went, and this I remember vividly, it was just constant screaming, scream. It was a Beatlemania kind of vibe, and just screaming, girls screaming, and it was we want Davy, we want Mickey, we want Mike, Peter, whatever. And Hendrix is up there playing Purple Haze, and Jimi finally had had enough of the screaming and just flipped them the bird, and that was the end of and Mickey tells the story in his show as always and it's like yeah we were like we felt really bad it was like jimmy you know we can't 
you're gonna have to go. We can't, you know, it's just not working because the monkeys were embarrassed at, you know, the teeny boppers and the kids. And Hendrix is doing this, you know, ridiculous art on the stage. And, you know, Mickey found him at, at uh, in California, um, one of the music festivals out there. And it was like, Mickey saw him and said, we gotta get this guy, this guy's cool. And, you know, they, Hanging out with Mickey Dolan's brother, he's the guy who should be doing this interview with you. That man has more stories and has done more things from fox hunting with Prince Charles to hanging out with Hendrick. You name it, he's done it. And he's just.